Hello, my name is Michael Glinsky from Sandia National Laboratories. I'm going to be talking to you about the relationship of the Moa scattering transformation. That's a deep convolutional network to causal physics, complexity, and topology. I'd like to thank my the contributors and other people uh, for useful discussions. Today I'm going to be talking to you about the Moat stat scattering transformation. Uh, it is uh, and was formed as a deep convolutional network uh, where you go and take a signal F, uh, convolve it with a filter bank of wave number P or scale or canonical momentum or quantum number. Then you rectify it with the modulus and then you pull it uh, with a, um, a windowing function, phi, where psi is the mother wavelet and phi is the father wavelet. You can continue this and make it a deep network by convolving it with a, a, another uh, set of wavelets of different wave numbers and then rectifying it and then pooling it uh, with the um, windowing function. There are also three different physics ways you can take a look at this. Uh, the first one will be a classical kinetic way through a generalized master equation, which ends up being a uh, density of all states P prime and rate into the state in, into a state P minus the rate uh, out of that state, which is the density uh, matrix in that state times the rate uh, from that state P to all state P prime. It also can go and have a field theoretical interpretation in terms of the scattering matrix, S matrix, where the first order transformation is the action averaged over quantum fluctuations and the second order transformation ends up being the inverse mass of the particle that mediates the, uh, uh, the field. But also growing out of this, uh, you can go and see that there is uh, this, um, that the second order transformation also has a topological interpretation uh, as a integration of a curvature over the uh, manifold or a topological index. What is a wavelet transformation? Well, you go and you take a signal X to T and you convolve it with wavelets that have been dilated different amounts so that you go and get signals that have been filtered uh, with increasingly sort of larger scales to larger scales. Here is an animation of that starting with the largest wave number to a medium wave number to and then finally the smallest wave number of the transformation. Stefan realized that the Fourier transform has a problem in that it's not continuous to def small deformations. Uh, here you can see an example where the Fourier transform of a signal when it's had a small deformation at large wave numbers shows large differences. This is the origin of the singularities in renormalization group theory, which also uses a Fourier basis. Uh, but uh, as well known, the Fourier transform is invariant uh, to translation. The opposite is true of the wavelet transformation. It is continuous to small deformations, but it is manifestly, because of its time dependence, uh, not invariant to translation. So Siphon decided that he had lemons, so he would make lemonade that he had the time dependence so that he could go and iterate this transformation. 
after the take, taking the transformation once, you can take it a second time and a third time and so on. But unless you go and have things that are scale ordered uh, or in terms of decreasing uh, wave number, that you find that you have little contribution to that transformation. And so you can see that, uh, for instance, you can only take the transformation with the largest wavelets of the ones that have been taken of the median and so on. But now you like to go and make sure that these things are translationally invariant. And you do that by this pooling with the or averaging with this father wavelet. So you take each of these traces, you take them to a point so that now you have a curve and you see that the uh, uh, loss scattering transformation is both uh, uh, continuous to small deformations and also invariant to translation, just so the translation is small compared to the father wavelet span. I also want to go and uh, note that uh, we have gone and said that things are lambda rather than lambda n. Uh, that comes because of the wave number scaling, that when you can sum these together, that you see that the, you can go and identify a path with a point on the real line. Also, another thing that Stefan noted was that this transformation is unitary. Why is this so important, especially this Lifshitz continuity or the fact that it ends up being continuous to uh, deformations? Well, that is because a large class of equations, uh, starting with the kinetic equations to fluid equations to field equations, uh, to material failure and strength, all can be viewed as advections by, in a high dimensional space uh, with possibly high dimensional space by a vector field U. Here I have written things in a coordinate free way in terms of exterior calculus where rho is the density form, the density of states. Uh, and L is the Lie derivative. Uh, that will be things uh, like um, uh, commutators, Poisson brackets, uh, A dot grad, grad V dot V, uh, V dot grad V, okay? We can now go and integrate all except little n uh, particles or dimensions and we end up finding that we still have this full derivative on the left-hand side, but now we get a collision term with the n plus first particle, or this is the BBGKY hierarchy. We now can go, following the ideas of Bugalubov, get to a generalized master equation uh, where F1 relaxes at a dynamic rate omega, it evolves into a function f uh, bar of one, which evolves at the collision rate, which is less than the dynamic rate. And then f2 relaxes at this collision rate to f2 bar, which evolves at the correlation rate, which is much less than the collision rate. Where the ratio of these is the correlation. And this is really an, a, an expansion in the weakness of correlation. Now, the, um, uh, let's go and take a pullback of the first two equations. Uh, we go and we see that we get the Poisson bracket as expected. And on the right-hand side, we start seeing we get something which is starting to look like a collision operator, a classic uh, collision operator. We get a similar equation for the two particle. This can be reduced, assuming separations of rates, uh, to this form, which is a generalized master equation, where if you identify F2 over F1 as K, it is the form that I talked about on the first slide. And now to connect it to Stefan's uh, scattering transformation, 
that uh, we need to dust off some old mathematics from the 1920s, the wigner weil transformation. The wigner weil transformation was a transformation of operators using a Fourier basis uh, to functions uh, that um, it used, that, since operators have both inputs and outputs, is a Fourier transform of both the input and the output side of the operator with a Fourier kernel. This ran into a lot of technical difficulties uh, because of extra terms that came into the commutator. Um, and, for, and also, uh, it is in obviously not manifold safe because that this kernel, if it's a Fourier kernel, has infinite extent. Well, the, what we have gone and posturized is that uh, we should be going and using the mother wavelet, uh, which you can go and tell by the, transform uh, the notation that we have used here. And when we go and do this and form the Wigner function, which is the Wigner transformation of the density operator, rho, uh, that you end up finding that that ends up being uh, f star psi quantity squared. Now we want to go and form the average or expected value of that uh, and also uh, go and take it of the f rather than the f squared. So we end up finding that we get uh, the, this form uh, where we have to average it over the father wavelet. But the father wavelets are now set up to form a partition of unity or the patches that will cover the manifold we sum over those partitions of unity, and we have a manifold safe wigner weil transformation of the density operator. Um, and But what is really interesting here is that this is the definition that Stefan had. We can continue to the two uh, wave number correlation function, and that ends up being nothing more than Stefan's definition of the second order transformation and so on. That is manifold safe. We now can go and switch to the quantum perspective uh, where we now will go and define the generating function where we have wave transformed uh, the field um, and the uh, other quantities uh, in the generating function. And then uh, we look at the connection to the canonical formulation uh, where we go and have the n uh, wave number correlation functions of the field. Uh, that can be shown uh, to be equal to the functional Taylor expansion of this generating function um, about the j equals zero point and that uh, if you go and uh, follow through on this definition, you find it is nothing more than Stefan's uh, formulation. I do want to say that we have neglected a field gauge factor in the transform. That is, a gauge comes from a gauge symmetry and corresponding massless gauge boson. Um, since we're going to be interested in the probability, we have just gone and chosen a gauge such that phi of p equals zero, giving the form that Stefan came up with. But subsequent work that Stefan has done has recognized that there is also information in the gauge of the field that you're dealing with that can be useful. We go on in order to make a, a closer identification of this. Uh, we go and define an effective action through a Legendre transform, expand, and S and phi as is normally done. And you can then go and show that the first order transformation is just the classical aver action averaged over fluctuations as a function of the inverse renormalization scale. And the second order transformation is the two state scattering cross section that is the scale dependent renorm um, the scale dependent renormalization mask as a function of initial and final inverse renormalization scale or wave number, or is the, uh, sort of the two particle uh, correlation rate. 
And now building on this quantum uh, view with these quantum uh, flux tubes, uh, we can go and relate this to algebraic topology. But first of all, I'd like to go and remind you that topology is studied via an index. An index is the integral of a curvature over the manifold that can go and be related to the homology group structure of the, or the uh, bedding, in this case, the bedding numbers, uh, which are the indices of the, uh, of, of the manifold. For instance, if you have a torus, uh, you go and find that you have two loops, B and A, where other loops B prime can be reduced to either B or A. And then you go and have only one uh, zero-dimensional loop and one two-dimensional loop. So the betting numbers are going to be one, two, two, one. And that can be pulled out from the uh, integral of this, um, of this uh, curvature form. Similar topological indexes, for instance, are, exist in MHD. Uh, the helicity is one of these, uh, which goes and represents the topological linking of the uh, uh, magnetic field lines. And so what is the relationship of the Mollat scattering uh, transformation to, top, to topology? Well, if we go and identify the effective action, entropy, or inverse Fisher information, as was previously introduced, the action, the path integral can be expanded around the stationary path where we set the first variation equal to zero at phi naught so that you go and have this form. And you go and then realize that the integrated curvature uh, is sitting here in terms of S2 to the minus one or in other words, that the functional curvature, which is now scale dependent, um, that is integrated over the index, is so that these second order uh, scattering coefficients are actually the topological indices of the manifold. And I want to go and say that this is really quite interesting because Stefan scattering transformation is the functional curvature or indices over these non integrated functional curvature or indices over these non Ramanian manifolds. Because they're non Ramanian, there is no uh, conventional uh, limit uh, to a single curvature. But, and, and, all, and they're so that if you now go to this definition of a functional curvature, not a derivative Ramanian curvature, uh, that is now scale dependent, uh, that you now have an analysis over these dynamical manifolds. But these non-Ramanian manifolds have a very interesting property, is that the topology is dependent upon the scale. For instance, if you go and take a look at this graph, and if you have two sets of edges, the small blue ones and the large red ones, you can go and see that the topology, if you looked at the red edges, could be a sphere, and the smaller blue edges would be a torus. Right? And this is a representation of the fact that physics is dependent upon the scale on which it is measured. But I also want to point out that this is very different than traditional topological data analysis. Traditional topological data analysis focuses on an extrinsic embedding of a Riemannian manifold with a well-defined differentiable metric and curvature. This topological analysis instead focuses on the intrinsic indices okay, that are in independent of the coordinate system, means independent, okay, of the coordinate system, of a non-Riemannian manifold with a scale-dependent functional curvature. Um, here are several reflections on uh, the uh, meaning of this two-scale correlation that we're looking at. 
I'm not going to go over the last two, but the first one is really quite interesting. And you can ask yourself, how can the temporal evolution, okay, these Ks, be obtained from a single state of the system at one time? The answer is that this system very quickly builds up a two-scale correlations that are signatures of dynamics. Think by analogy of a plasma governed by electrostatic forces. It very quickly builds up two-point correlations to buy shielding, and these correlations, if you go and look at them, will go and effectively tell you what the physics is. Now let's get to the interesting part, is that what is the relationship of this generalized master equation to complexity, that is emergent behavior and self-organization? Here is that master equation. Uh, normally, uh, we go and start with linear instability analysis, where we turb, perturb the, the density of states by a little bit. Uh, we then go and derive a dispersion relationship. Uh, we go and take a look at the modes. Uh, we try to go and have systems where there uh, is no instability or a little bit of instability or that we have small perturbations of the uh, system so that there is not enough time for things to grow. Well, things normally go and grow a lot and get into a nonlinear state. And so the question really comes, what is the nonlinear steady state of the system? And that if you go and solve this, you go and see these systems go to these nonlinear steady states which can be something to have a normal cascade, like 3D Navier-Stokes, um, or have inverse cascades, like 2D Navier-Stokes. And these end up being, these profiles end up being the steady states of the system, right? And let me talk a little bit more about the solution and structure of these generalized master equations, right? that he, first of all that you need to go and should be working with uh, density with distribution functions that are normalized by the density states or equivalently a Dirac measure so that you end up getting the form that we see and have a strict equality. Uh, you also can go and note that there is detailed balance um, uh, so that uh, which is really a commutation relationship in terms of the reaction rates K. Uh, if you take a look uh, that the Ks have a strong function of a Green's function, uh, where if you remember that F2 has to have uh, P, uh, the wave number, in decreasing order, okay? Um, and so that uh, if you want to go and have the reaction rate in the opposite order, you need to use detailed balance in order to be able to go and flip things uh, so that you can go and find uh, the reaction rates in the opposite uh, direction, right? Uh, from uh, small to big K, right? Uh, you can go and turn this into a matrix equation uh, uh, of this form, uh, which ends up being a simple relationship to the to Stefan's scattering coefficients, uh, effectively the second order one in the upper triangle, but in the lower triangle, you need to go and bring in the density of states and the entropy of the system. Uh, that given a lot of evolutions or a, a long temporal evolution, of the system, uh, you can go and uh, estimate uh, just by a least squares uh, procedure uh, the uh, uh, the measure uh, of mu p uh, and also the off diagonal elements of the K matrix, or you could go and estimate uh, just the measure. Uh, one triangle of the uh, that's uh, directly related to Stefan's scattering coefficients, and then uh, for the other uh, triangle of that matrix, 
uh, estimated by just the actions uh, divided by K Boltzmann T. Um, and then uh, you can also then and go for uh, the um, uh, mu P, um, uh, you can go and analytically drive that from the Dirac normalization. It doesn't need to be estimated. The uh, upper triangle can be directly related from just one time using the Stefan scattering transformation. Or uh, you can even drive uh, both the uh, scattering uh, transformation and the action for given the Lagrangian. And in that case, uh, you can go and estimate only one parameter, which would be K Boltzmann T from the data. And that's going to be the largest of the quantum, thermal, or measurement fluctuations. And so also, let's take a look at this nice linear structure of the generalized master equation. Decompose that uh, reaction rate matrix uh, into an eigen decomposition, uh, rotate uh, the uh, normalized uh, distribution uh, function, density function, uh, you know, to that eigen basis, and you obviously have these nice exponential, uh, independent exponential solutions, uh, where you go and find that states converge exponentially onto a null space of, of k lambda naught, so that where, let's say for instance, your overall dynamical manifold was this torus, the null space is lambda naught, you would go and see a, an initial state f naught uh, go and converge onto its projection uh, onto the null state, uh, and be swept onto here as time goes on at the collisional time of the system. Uh, you also can do a finite difference of the generalized master equation, but that does have a current condition where delta t must be less than 1 over the largest absolute value of the eigenvalues of the matrix. But this solution here is fully nonlinear with no um, uh, constraint on how large delta t will be. And finally, to go and see what this means in terms of a real system. Here you see a liner in a pulse power experiment. Uh, you see the perturbations as um, here mapped out as a function of time. Uh, you see mode merger and an inverse cascade. Um, and so that if you go and take a look at the distribution or the transformation of there that you're pumping at this state here, and that ends up getting carried down to this steady state at large scale. And so the main questions are, what is the steady state? Well, that's the fixed point or the projection of the initial state onto the null manifold of the generalized master equation. How does the system, physical system gets there? The answer is the second order Malat uh, scattering coefficients or the, that reaction uh, kernel or matrix that uh, I showed on the earlier thing. This uh, scattering transformation has an efficient implementation with in Python using Keras and TensorFlow that can be found at this link. And finally, in summary, uh, we've shown you this deep convolutional network that Stefan came up with and its interpretation in terms of classical kinetics, field theory, and topology of the dynamical manifold. Thank you very much.